welcome back in this lecture we will look at the second uh, chapter emergence of discipline from this very interesting book by professor r w khan i have a strong personal interest in this topic um besides being in the department of chemical engineering at iit kanpur i am also associated with the material science program it's a very interesting program with certain unique features it's a pg only program that is it emphasizes emphasizes only on mtech and phd education and research and all the participating faculty are from other departments in the sense that faculty are from physics chemical engineering electrical engineering mechanical engineering aerospace engineering chemistry and biological engineering and so on so this brings in a highly interdisciplinary nature to the program so historically it was started uh, in 1972 73 so perhaps this was one of the first material science academic ecosystem in the country in india so at that time it was very unique um material science and engineering has evolved um in the country and especially in our institute so we are trying to redefine our context and purpose in within the uh, institute and also we are trying to revitalize on how we should be expanding um so i'm particularly interested uh, in how do you think about interdisciplinary programs um not only at the level of postgraduate education and research and also at but also at the undergraduate level because i got my undergraduate degree in an national research lab this is not a traditional university or educational institute so this is one of the 39 uh, research labs that belong uh, the department of council for scientific and industrial research this national lab specializes in electrochemical science and engineering it's called central electrochemical research institute so they had this interesting idea to have a btech in a fairly specialized um, sub discipline called electrochemical engineering so soon it evolved into btech in chemical and electrochemical engineering that's uh my, that's the degree i got as a btech um student so so similar fairly specialized undergraduate program exists elsewhere especially in let's say instrumentation uh, engineering uh, nano science so engineering science technology became uh, fairly popular in probably in mid 2000 and so on there are many such programs in india uh, there are some genetic engineering programs in india of late energy science and engineering has also arisen in different places for it it, uh, it was started long time ago in let's say nit delhi then later in nit bombay and many other institutions in india um, recently it started in iit kanpur there are many other institutions which have energy science and engineering so the questions i am interested in is when do you start a program which appears um, fairly specialized and if, even when you start uh, some such program at a particular point in time how do you nucleate it and nurture it uh, in the course of time how can we evolve such uh, programs okay so that's these are the questions i'm in general interested uh, both at the level of ug education and at the level of pg education and research so 
Professor Khan, these are when I quote something within quotations, these are just taken out of the book. Um, so he says that material science emerged via synthesis of metallurgy, solid state physics, and physical chemistry. Here's some supporting arguments that are presented in this chapter. So he says there are two alternatives for defining um, a new discipline. One is they may emerge by splitting or they may emerge by integration. Um, these are two different things, actually. These are not just uh, synonymous. So, for example, uh, an, an field can emerge by splitting from a particular um, discipline. For example, there are institute or just take this particular example. When you say electrochemical engineering, it is a subpart of chemical engineering. So in order to develop a more specific and focused expertise, a discipline may emerge out. There are, uh, for example, in other institution uh, I studied, Indian Institute of Science, there is a department of organic chemistry, department of inorganic and physical chemistry, department of structural and solid state chemistry. Okay, so, so these are what one might consider to be fairly specialized uh, sub-discipline of some major disciplines, let's say chemistry or chemical engineering. So that might be nucleated so that we can um, encourage a specific expertise in a uh, shorter period of time. Okay, so that is one way to think about a discipline or subdiscipline. Some other disciplines might have been nucleated, unnurtured to present a generalist viewpoint. For example, I always consider material science engineering as opposed to let's say metallurgy um, is a general generalist approach to a discipline. So when you think about material science and engineering, we are not only thinking about uh, metallurgy or the properties, uh, processing and uh, characterization of metals. We are also thinking about characterization, processing and synthesis of ceramics, semiconductors, polymers and so on. So an attempt is being made to present a generalist uh, viewpoint. So both have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so when a subdiscipline emerges by splitting, uh, it may have an you may be able to produce narrow expertise, which is uh, advantages in some case and can be disadvantages in some other cases. Same thing about a generalist uh, viewpoint. So all these things have to be thought through, uh, and he presents uh, emergence of other uh, disciplines that are related to material science and engineering. He starts with the emergence of physical chemistry. This is a very, very fascinating uh, reading. I've been interested from uh, my high school times. So, for example, if you look, uh, consider Avogadro hypothesis. Uh, so, everybody knows about Avogadro hypothesis. It is presented in high school. What is fascinating is how did uh, Avogadro come up with this hi hypothesis and with this number, a uh, number, okay? So when you say one mole has this many number of uh, molecules or atoms, how was this um, discovered in early 1800s? Okay, this uh, very, you, you have to think about it, okay? So these are very nice set of experiments and thought processes that went into this hypothesis. Um, a lot of creativity um, has gone into this. So he mentions this, gives appropriate references and so on. And another thing that's just fascinating is this, you might have heard about how Kikule had his dream to come up with the benzene structure. Okay, These are remarkable pieces of creativity that happened in 1865. So another thing is uh, tetrahedral carbon about Van Hoff. Okay, so uh, this is another very fascinating uh, piece of history. Okay, so there are other possibilities. Okay, when you say tetrahedral carbon, 
all the five atoms can be on the same in the same plane or it can be it can have a tetrahedral structure these are not one and the same so what kind of experiments that led to this hypothesis okay in those times you can only hypothesize there are no in very specialized experimental technique that can unambiguously uh, provide proof for the existence of tetrahedral carbon. It's also fascinating that Van Hoff did this uh, in his PhD, okay, so at the very early stage of his research career, career. So he came up with this, and it was done in 1974. What makes all these things even more fascinating was that in those times, the reality of atoms was still being debated. Okay, so if you know the uh, sad uh, history of uh, Boltzmann and so on, uh, um, the reality of atoms was uh, debated. There were uh, two schools of thought, one led by, let's say, Ernst Mach and uh, another led by a few other scientists. And there was very uh, heated debates uh, debate on things that we take for granted. Even Oswald, ha uh, despite uh, many important contributions which were fairly atomic in nature, uh, did not really believe in atoms um, in in his early stages because Oswald is well known for um, his elucidation of ions in solution. Okay? This seems to be very close related to atoms. So, even such scientists had doubts about the reality of uh, atoms. So you, these kinds of uh, great uh, ideas in science have to be uh, thought through in times when even the reality of atoms was not clear. Okay, So that's what makes uh, these discoveries and hypotheses really wonderful. So in those times, there were a lot of discussions and divisions. Okay, So chemistry was... Uh, there were two big branches. One was organic chemists and inorganic chemists. People in organic chemistry believe there were certain molecules that can only made in the biological setting. Okay, so the synthesis of urea outside uh, human body was a big uh, step in clarifying certain notions. And what is to be noted was uh, the discussions with me mainly centered around specific chemicals. Okay, That's the way the discussion in chemistry was uh, taking place. But Oswald, as opposed to that, he wanted to generalize. He wanted to move the focus from a specific chemical and get the focus to reactions in general. Okay, So can we think about uh, reactions, equilibrium reactions, reactions that uh, on factors underlying rates of reactions and so on. So he uh, moved the focus away from specific chemistry of a particular chemical to generalized notions and principles underlying reactions. That was a big step um, that in turn led to generalizable concepts underlying chemistry. Okay, So instead of thinking about the specific chemical, specific chemical reaction underlying the synthesis of one particular chemical, uh, Oswald tried to generalize. Oswald and others tried to generalize. And this generalization in turn gave uh, identity to physical chemistry. This is still uh, an important feature of physical chemistry. Um, the generality is an important feature of physical chemistry. With that came specific research topics, distinct textbooks, journals, uh, degrees were awarded in physical chemistry, department uh, were nucleated, institute, and uh, Nobel Prizes recognize physical chemists. Okay, so these are themes that occur in many disciplines. Uh, so these are the things that define uh, disciplines and nurture them. So this can be considered in across different sub-disciplines that are mentioned later in the chapter. So he also talks about chemical engineering. Okay, So the large-scale manufacture of chemicals was an important aspect that gave identity to 
uh, chemical engineering as opposed to, let's say, chemistry or applied chemistry. Uh, this, there was a lot of discussion in Boston Tech, which is later became the famous MIT. So these are important events that happened in late 1800s. Uh, so how do you make chemistry more useful? This was one of the important questions that was debated and discussed. And to do that, you have to bring in engineering and what kind of engineering that can be brought into chemistry to make this possible. Okay, so that was um, discussed. And every discipline that is nucleated has to have something unique. I always uh, try to ask this question. So when you try to come up with a new sub-discipline, you want to form a new department, let's say in an institute, can we offer a course that is not there in any other place, okay, in the already existing in any other department. That's, I feel that gives a identity to uh, the department or a new academic ecosystem. So, for example, in the case of chemical engineering, this notion of unit operation, that was, uh, that gave identity to chemical engineering, okay. So, uh, techno-economics was practice much more in chemical engineering than in chemistry or applied chemistry. These features gave identity to chemical engineering. So, and uh, petrochemicals was one of the important uh, factors that brought in chemical engineering. So there were two ways of looking at petrochemicals. So supposing you typically isolate uh, petrochemicals, you make break them into smaller components and typically a synthetic chemist tries to make larger components again so this looks sort of uh, contradictory right you first initially spend a lot of uh, effort in breaking uh, molecules into smaller components let's say uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen and you remake uh, from the smaller molecules, larger molecules via, let's say, a fissiotrope synthesis and so on. Uh, so there are other ways of thinking about this. Instead of taking this approach, breaking and then remaking, can we separate long chain molecules from a chemical soup? Okay, So uh, this was one of the important questions that is discussed in chemical engineering. So, and then another question that is often debated even now is whether you have uh, predominantly science-based curriculum or a more engineering-based curriculum. So when I say this, I'm talking about an undergraduate in engineering, okay, even in chemical engineering. And for example, in IIT Kanpur, we have what is called an engineering science curriculum uh, with a lot of emphasis in fundamental sciences. Uh, math, physics, chemistry, and biology is emphasized even in engineering education. In some other places, more technology-oriented, engineering-based curriculum is practiced. What is um, important uh, and what is your end goal? These are all uh, issues have to be debated before you think through these questions. So support of industry is very critical. Many important uh, industries uh, in period, uh, have um, supported specific department. Shell, for example, has supported specific departments. Uh, the chemical engineering programs in Cambridge University were supported by specific industry. So this gives proper defining goals of an academic program and uh, also nurtures specific R&D program within an university setting. So these are still important questions when we think about academic programs uh, in the modern context. So then he goes on to discuss issues of polymer science. First, in those times when it emerged, what was a polymer itself was not clear because one of the things that actually worked against nurturing of polymer science is this field of colloid colloid science. Okay, So colloids were uh, sort of, there were vague notions of what is a colloid. So many people argued that polymer were no different from a colloid. Okay, So when, when Brownian motion was discussed, colloids were discussed in the context of Brownian motion and so on, colloids uh, sort of existed even before polymers as far as I know. So people didn't really think this was any different from colloids. 
colloids may exist uh, by uh, more weaker interactions, let's say Van der Waals interactions and so on. So one of the defining aspects that differentiated polymers from colloids is the stability. Okay, so polymers are, uh, the monomers of a polymer are interconnected by covalent bonds, but colloids are not uh, so, not, not uh, they're, they're different chemical entities compared to polymers. So the stability helped in differentiating uh, polymers from colloids. Okay, so stability of polymers in a variety of uh, solvents and um, liquid environment helped clarify the difference between these two uh, fields. Again, uh, polymers had its own challenges in characterization. So that's one of the reasons why polymers is often not practiced by chemists uh, chemist needs with uh, well characterized, characterized molecules. So this is typically possible in uh, low molecular weight uh, chemical species. Okay, so when you go to a polymer that has polydispersity, characterization of polymers can it, can itself be engineering. So often polymers is being practiced in um, engineering departments. For typical, most of the chemical engineering departments have polymer, many uh, faculty who work in polymer science and engineering. So they have enormous utility in um, industry, especially World War II also brought out some specific aspects of uh, polymer science, applied polymer science of engineering, uh, applied polymer science and engineering. Uh, these uh, important references are quoted in this particular chapter. It makes, again, interesting reading. Colloids. So he, uh, Professor Khan uh, claims that this is a field that did not take off. Okay, so I feel that one of the reasons it did not take off is that it uh, it was, it was came in too early. For example, what I mean by that is uh, colloid and interfacial phenomena uh, sort of uh, morphed got morphed into surface science and later into nanoscience. Okay, so this uh, happened in uh, 2000 and the people who typically uh, started working on nanoscience came from these two fields. Uh, many people who uh, worked on soft colloids and interfacial phenomena, uh, they came to nanoscience in a particular way and people who worked on solid surfaces and its science and engineering uh, again came to nanoscience. So in a way, I do, I do not really think that co colloidal uh, science and engineering had a death in an academic environment. Uh, I think that it got morphed into nanoscience and technology. So he also discusses solid state physics and solid state chemistry. Uh, he uh, observes that this is still practiced as a subdiscipline in the sense that solid state physics has remained as an important subdiscipline of physics and solid state chemistry has uh, remained as an important subdiscipline of chemistry. There are not um, many institutions which have separate departments for solid state physics or solid state chemistry. I know it is done in uh, Indian Institute of Science, uh, but other than uh, some specialized um, places, I am not aware whether there are a separate department for solid state chemistry or solid state um, physics. So I also like uh, the co comment of Feynman in, in his famous uh, lectures in uh, physics. So he says solid state physics only half of physics and uh, the other half is mostly engineering. Okay, so there are you should look up this comment why he says so. It uh, again it makes you think on what he thinks is physics. So I feel that solid state physics has uh, been adapted very well in material science and engineering, and it has also morphed to condensed matter physics in physics department. So, uh, so the identity has changed a little bit on going from solid state physics to condensed matter physics and the way solid state physics has been adapted in material science engineering. The emphasis also has changed. So uh, the demarcation between inorganic chemistry and solid state chemistry is uh, still not very easy to 
draw this line. So that is one of the reason why um, solid state chemistry has remained as a subpart of inorganic chemistry, which is again subpart of chemistry in general. So he moves on to continuum mechanics and atomistic simulation of solids. Um, mechanics itself is very interesting. If you look at early history of mechanics, this was done, um, practiced by uh, great mathematicians, okay, so Lagrange and so on. So there are a lot of abstraction, uh, which is very different from the way mechanics can be thought through in a very modern context, okay. These abstractions played an important role in the early development of mechanics. So uh, uh, what makes a particularly interesting reading is so-called rational mechanics practiced uh, by Trusdell, okay. So he has written a lot about uh, continuum mechanics in general. He's an important historian of mechanics. So if you're interested in this fairly abstract uh, presentation, you should look up the reading of uh, books written by True Step. So uh, Professor Khan also differentiates uh, applicable mathematics. Okay, It's not just applied mathematics. So how can uh, mathematics can be made more applicable and less abstract? It's an important uh, discussion. Um, so you should read up uh, references that are sort of provided uh, in this chapter. So the way continuum mechanics is practiced by solid state physicists is sort of different from the way it is done by mechanical engineer, civil engineer, chemical engineer, and materials engineer. So all these communities have their own version of mechanics, okay? So this is very important. For example, I, we work in a field called solid state batteries, okay? So the mechanics relevant to solid state batteries is very different from uh, what uh, the mechanics practiced by, let's say, continuum mechanicians, okay? So every community has its, in my opinion, has its own uh, version of uh, mechanics. So I feel this field flows in not just a literal sense, it also uh, in a metaphorical sense. Okay, there is a very famous fluid mechanician, extremely creative fluid mechanician, uh, Professor G. A. Taylor. Uh, he looked at plasticity and made extremely important and creative contribution uh, to the field of uh, mechanics in general and many of this has been adopted by material scientists so uh, these important references uh, has to be read so these are provided in this particular chapter so in the next chapter he talks about uh, precursors for material science so that will be looked at in the next uh, snippet thank you